Welcome to Fintech Insider Interviews, coming to you from Money 2020 in Amsterdam. I'm Simon Taylor, and it's my pleasure, my goodness, is it my pleasure to be joined by the one and only Richard Piers of Microsoft, and of course, Martin Hearing of Finastra. How are you, gentlemen? Perfectly we are fine. very good, excited, enjoying the show, having a great time. Yeah? Absolutely. Good stuff already. Um, are you guys officially teamed up last year to launch Fusion Dot Fabric um, on Azure? Like, reminders of that partnership because we did a special on uh, in Fusion One, but we talked uh, a lot more about uh, kind of the nature of banks collaborating and, and and the future of platforms and the future of AIs and how you innovate. So it's a much more topical conversation than it was really about your platform. So you know, tell me about how a partnership between you two came together and, and why that partnership was so important for both of you. Sure. Well, I think if I, if I take a go at that, first of all, what we uh, did as a company about two years ago is to say that we want to be vertically focused, always very a horizontal company that sort of empowered others. And in so doing, it didn't mean that we wanted to become you know, a provider of banking or banking uh, independent software, but to work with the very best in the industry uh, and make sure that, that what they're doing is empowered by you know, the underlying cloud platform. So we just went around the market and engaged with uh, those, uh, the big sort of giants uh, in the industry. And obviously as we're doing with SAP and Adobe, you, know, you go to Finastra you know, if you yeah. want to sort of pick it out. So that was the start thing for us. Well, and on, on our side, we were looking for a player that can work with us to build uh, the largest open platform to serve uh, fintechs, banks, uh, independent software vendors, even schools or universities. Uh, this is where the whole discussion started between the two companies. So who approached who? Was there a cheesy opening line? Was there a wink at the bar? No, like... no, we, we are working together for uh, probably a, a decade. Uh, okay. because there was no uh, app involved. Yeah, <laughs> no, didn't swipe no, right. No, 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 that was like, yeah, there was a bit of that going on. But We, no. we are using Microsoft infrastructure for, for a long, long time. Uh, and at a certain point, we said, hey, let's deepen that relationship because we were looking for a major player outside who could be the, the choice and, and the trustful partner to deliver the infrastructure underneath the platform. And I think, Richard, it's probably fair to say that you guys in financial services have made a bit of headway in the past couple of years as the trusted partner, but also Azure as a platform is now increasingly gaining real ground and credibility. If, I, if you'd have spoken to uh, engineers and developers two, three years ago and said AWS versus Azure, it was a, it was a one horse race, yeah. but I don't think that's the case anymore. No, and I, th it's kind of if you look at what happened, I think there was obviously there was the sort of you know infrastructure as a service was the first move to the cloud, and obviously AWS made a good play on that early. We kind of went to PaaS early, and so there was a bit of a resettlement going on. But actually, in financial services, uh, as it's come together, we just spent so much time with the regulators. I think that's really been our sort of strength, and we've gone around the world continuously engaging, making sure that both technically and in terms of you know the the contracts the ability to operate the governance of how do you inspect that you know, data center. We've really worked on that super hard. And as people are standing up challenges, fintechs and, and so forth, they go, they're bumping into that regulation and compliance, and we kind of know how to answer it really well. Which, which is a huge differentiator, but I guess on top of that, you, you can do that only if the, the PaaS and the infrastructure as a service stuff is also at least as good as. Oh, for sure, yeah. yeah I so mean, but I kind of take it as, I mean, I've been in technology long enough, it's kind of everybody plays leapfrogs on the tech, and the tech sort of, you know, after, after you get to the top two or three players, then it's always kind of, you know, leapfroggy. It's then about how you package it and do trustworthy delivery. And a great CTO will always know how to, to, to kind of manage those business yeah. pieces. But from a Finastra perspective, you're a year into this partnership. You know, what have been the key aspects to that partnership from your perspective? Well, uh, it's not just the infrastructure that, that Microsoft provided to us, it's also the surrounding ecosystem. When you think about the work Microsoft does on the AI side, machine learning, uh, their ODI initiative, that all are components that play towards that platform approach. Uh, and we are in this uh, core banking business for 35 years, so it was ideal to combine both expertise to deliver that platform. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's interesting the difference in that partnership model. Like a lot of people throw around the P word like it's some kind of thing, you know, like, oh, we, we did a contract once, now we're partners. But actually, yeah. the, uh, it's one thing to have the tool and, and it's another thing to deeply integrate with the organization, teach people how to use it, and, and help people get the most from it. And I think 
standing up at each other's events, doing conferences together, like that sort of thing is, you know, you, you are literally sitting next to each other right now at an event on a podcast. Oh my God. So yeah. we are, I thought this was a green screen activity. Yeah. 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 No, but like that, that's a different kind of partnership than you would have traditionally seen with, with you know, supplier of a technology platform to somebody who's, who's building that for customers. Yeah, and I mean, just things like Scott Guthrie obviously heads the Azure cloud for Microsoft. You know, he's he's on a monthly, weekly call with Ellie um, going through, you know, the engineering cycle of what, what's going on. I mean, this is, you know, a man that's, that's handling the whole of the Azure platform across every single industry and every sort of subset. And yet with Finastra, you know, he's going through that level of engagement. So, and, and I think, as you know, he was at the Fusion event in Tobacco Dock recently. Yeah. So really committing, you know, the top leadership. It's not just kind of... People like me, it's the it's the big guns there. So it is indeed, and it sort of speaks to the new Microsoft really as to a much more approachable sort of um, mentality. Um, and of course, um, as you're not just under the FusionFabric.cloud, it's a lot of your payments stuff as well. You guys do a lot of stuff. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the payment solutions and some of the benefits of taking those into a cloud platform? Sure. Uh, outside of payments, we, we have a lot of more products coming uh, into the cloud because. We just truly believe that all of our products over time will be cloud enabled. Uh, it's just a matter of time. But especially in payments where you need high scalability, uh, where you need a very um, effective infrastructure, where margin is, is tight, um, this is the preferred area to put into the cloud and offer customers better scalability, turning CapEx into uh, OpEx and, and vice versa. It's, it's just uh, the scalability of the payments industry which makes it cloud ideal. And, and have you seen, uh, so I've, I've observed this recently, a, a lot of uh, financial institutions I speak to are trying to take their existing sort of either home-built platforms or other vendor-built platforms and take them and lift and drop them in the cloud as if somehow that's going to reduce their cost. But the code base might not have been architected to take advantage of the cloud. So the cloud can be a really robust, secure architecture if you've built for cloud. But if you've not built for cloud and thought about that cloud architecture, that can be really challenging. So you know, you've kind of been on this journey. Uh, how has Microsoft been able to help you with that journey? Well, I think there are three steps. You, you have first, you have legacy software that sometimes might run on mainframe or, or other stuff. Uh, f the first step is that you cloudify it. So you make it adjustable and, and, and uh, runnable on, on the Azure stack, yeah. and you use a lot of tools. Uh, the last step is then really make the software multi-tenant, which is a huge step forward. Yeah. Uh, but for the banking industry, uh, not a lot of areas need really multi-tenant systems. Uh, sometimes it's just a kind of lift and shift from a monolithic infrastructure into the cloud. Instead of using other databases, you suddenly use Microsoft databases, or you use security mechanisms from Microsoft, or the deployment mechanisms. So you can do a lot um, uh, in quickly ramping up um, a legacy implication into a cloud uh, environment. And, and when you guys stand back and look at the, the big trends, I guess cloud and AI are the, the two really big ones. Um, but I guess, uh, are you seeing any other uh, trends around just good management of data, open banking, inclusivity, and platformification of services? Well, today, two of the keynotes yesterday and today from Santander and from ING, they both said, the future of the banking is in the platform. Yeah. They both want to be platform-based businesses. Yeah. Uh, so when I think about the mega trend here at Money 2020, it was the notion of platform as a service or banking as a platform. I think on the data side, um, you know, we were talking just in, in, in intro there about the open data initiative. So one of the things that we're trying to do at Microsoft is to help with this exchange of data. So ODI, um, then the common data model and the common data service. And we've obviously gone out initially planning with SAP and Adobe and, and Finastra. And that's the ability to sort of bring a lot of this data together in obviously a safe and secure way in a GDPR world. Um, and then allowing people to build apps in a kind of no code environment off of some of those data schemas. Um, uh, but ultimately it's allowing people to be able to access the data outside of silo, which gives them what they need to do to do the micro personalization that everybody talks about, but without the data, you're not going to get there. Hyper personalization is one of these things that get thrown around, and I think uh, it's this, it's a wonderful concept. This yeah. idea that I could have a product that was built and engineered for you and yeah. bespoke and yeah. tailored to you yes. and your situation in your interests and in your benefit. But actually, if my platforms don't allow me to do it, then it's no good. If I can't access the data, if I can't cleanse it, if I can't use it, 
and I can't get it real time, it doesn't make any sense. This is why the ODI initiative is so uh, important. This is why we wanted to uh, work hand in hand here with Microsoft because without uh, homogeneous data architecture, you can't access that data from an AI or ML perspective. So uh, all this new technology will not work without a consistent database underneath. And it's not going to be trivial because people are going, well, why would I give you my data and how are we going to yeah. do this safely and securely and how can I give permission? And so we're working through that, you know, technically, operationally uh, with these big organizations. It's going to play out over, you know, three or four years. Yeah, it's going to take some time. These things yeah. aren't done overnight, but no. you're seeing the beginnings of people doing really interesting things in the platform space? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, we've spoken about various other players out there in the sort of, you know, the challenger space. Um, but I think that, that what we're seeing, you know, in, whether it's in fund management, asset management, investment, it's going away from just being a kind of the retail and uh, SME banking. It's crossing the whole sort of Rubicon of financial services now. And that's really interesting. I hear that a lot is like, oh, well, uh, fintech's just an SME thing, right? And it's a, it's a retail thing. It's not really coming. It's never going to attack M&A, is it? And, and it feels like there's, there are certain types of, you know, there's a, a, an almost defensive behavior to retrench and go, yeah, sure, it's just a retail thing, which five years ago would have been a crazy thing to say. But now it's like, it's almost like, yeah, no, they're, they're, they're there, they're playing, it's fine. But you're seeing something different? Uh, absolutely. I th think about the whole trade finance area, uh, trading platforms, exchanges, uh, and even the next step of platform is a marketplace where the bank is like Amazon, a mediator in between buyers and sellers. Yeah. Uh, securitization of trades comes in. So platform is, is uh, uh, enabling way more than uh, just a, a playground for fintechs. So, so what does it look like in the next couple of years? Does it keep marching through the uh, value chain of banking? And uh, do other players start to come in? Do the big techs come in? Do the fintechs start to disrupt more? Uh, will the incumbents get their act together? What, what, what's your money on? <laughs> I mean, I think it's, you know, like anything else, you know, we've, we've all been standing around to, saying mainframes are going to disappear, everything's going to disappear. There will be elements of everything that will remain that's ever been kind of invented. It'll be, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know how many years ago we used to say get big, get niche or get out. That was a kind of an e-commerce phrase or something. It feels like that again. You're going to have big utilities that may be just sort of taking over, I'm going to be the guy that does all the KYC AML, uh, or I'm going to be the distribution platform. So there'll be some big consolidations of things that everybody's doing. Then there'll be some amazing sort of, you know, niche providers. And then there'll be the marketplace, you know, uh, players in there who are going to try and broker, whether that's brokering APIs, whether that's brokering data, whether that's brokering, you know, crime. There's going to be a lot of this spreading out of your core competency into either a super big or a niche, but with some aggregation in the middle, I think. I think that's super interesting as you think about FusionFabric.cloud. You've got a potential for a lot of niche players to come into that and, and really add value into financial services. If I've got the best uh, fraud prevention capability, I can sort of provide that now to, to many banks through that access. If I've got some widget that helps identify uh, people who may be, uh, you know, kind of prevent financial crime by identifying people from different databases and doing machine learning on data from documents. All of that kind of stuff can, can sit in a platform and, and it can be really great at that thing, but a platform can help me distribute. Yeah. But also at the end, there will be a shakeout. There will be a consolidation of players in the yeah. market. There will be also a standardization. Uh, and the question is, uh, are vendors able to standardize uh, some of that? Or are there associations or government people who are doing this more from a regulatory angle? I think uh, in yeah. interesting time. And then time. you'll get to beyond banking. You know, you'll actually will get beyond looking at our at ourselves in financial services or providers to financial services. And people will go, how can I genuinely put this in amongst the world of other supply chains or other industries or other use cases? That's where I think this stuff gets really yeah. interesting. When when banking stops being about how do I serve my banking customers with a little bit differently, and how does banking serve uh, the economy and how does it start to fit into end-to-end -end journeys. Like that, Jason always talks about uh, the move from commodity product to intelligent services and from intelligent services really through to end-to-end -to -end journeys. Uh, and, and actually, uh, we're still seeing that shift from commodity products to intelligent services, yeah. people doing smarter things to serve their own customers better, using one or two other people maybe to, to help that journey. But the end-to-end -end journeys is, where does that fit into a broader story? And yeah. that's where things get really rock and roll. Absolutely. Long way to go yet. Indeed. All righty. Well, Richard Martin, thank you so much for joining us. Where can people find out more about uh, Azure? Well, uh, Microsoft.com, Azure. 
I've, I, yeah, I feel like that might be quite easy to search for on your favorite search engine that may or may not, not the be hardest big. thing. <laughs> look at the trust portal. I think that's actually the interesting to look at. Is that's how do we do all the compliance in the banking industry? Microsoft.com, Azure, that's the marketing stuff, right? But get serious, get in amongst the trust uh, oh, there, there's, there's a nerd reference, <laughs> I respect that. Uh, how about yourself, Martin? What, what, where can well, we first go to fusionfabric.cloud, register and uh, try it. And if you want to find me, go to LinkedIn. Uh, well, we will give it a try for sure. All right, as for me, you can find me at SY Taylor on Twitter. Thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, remember to subscribe to our podcast and review us on iTunes and also tell all your friends to listen to. Uh, if you have any suggestions or feedback, reach out on Twitter or email. You can email us at podcasts at 11fs.com or you can also find us at Fintech Insiders. Uh, thank you very much and goodbye for now.